Welcome to this lecture about the one sample t-test. To understand the content of this video, I recommend that you first watch the video about the t-distribution, as well as the video about how to calculate the standard deviation. In this lecture, we'll go through the basics of a one sample t-test, and discuss how we should interpret the so-called p-value, since this is the first lecture where we'll encounter p-values. The one sample t-test is a statistical test that can be used to check if the mean value from a sample is significantly different from a hypothesized or known value. The formula for calculating the so-called t-statistic for a one sample t-test looks like this. Where x bar represents our estimated mean value, s e the standard error of the mean, and mu zero which denotes the hypothesized value which can be seen as a reference value. We'll now try this formula based on a simple example. Let's say that we would like to investigate the effect of a new diet. We recruit six random individuals from the population of interest that test the new diet for four weeks. The first person gained two kilos after the diet, and the second person gained one kilo, whereas the third person lost three kilos, and so forth. The mean change of the weights is negative 0.5, which means that the average weight loss was 0.5 kilos for the six individuals. The mean weight loss gives us the value of x bar. Next, we calculate the standard error of the mean. Remember from the lecture about the standard error that it is calculated by dividing the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. Since we do not know the population standard deviation, we need to estimate the standard deviation based on our sample. I have here already calculated the sample standard deviation to about 1.87. Watch the lecture about the standard deviation to see how this is calculated. Since we have observed the weight change of 6 individuals, our sample size is equal to 6. If you do the math, we see that the standard error is equal to about 0.763. Since we want to test if the mean body weight has changed after the diet, our reference value is therefore zero. If the diet has an effect, we should observe a mean weight change that is either smaller or larger than zero. Let's plug in the values for the sample mean and the standard error, as well as the value of mu zero, which we set to zero. If you do the math, we see that the t-statistic is equal to about negative 0.655. Next, we use the t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Since our sample size n is equal to 6, we should use the t-distribution with 5 degrees of freedom. Let's add a vertical line in this distribution at negative 0.655 as well as a line at positive 0.655. By using a software, we can calculate the area that covers these tails to 0.54. The area that covers these tails represents the so-called p-value. Since this area can only range from 0 to 1, the p-value is always a value between 0 and 1. How do we interpret this p-value? If we assume that there is no effect, the p-value can be interpreted as the probability that the observed effect, or a more extreme effect, could be observed due to chance. In our example, this would imply that if we assume that the diet has no effect on the weight, the probability that we would observe a mean difference of 0.5 kilos or more is 54%. It is therefore highly likely that the observed difference of 0.5 kilos is just due to chance and that the diet has no effect at all. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, this implies that there is a weak or no evidence that the diet has an effect. And if the p-value is between 0.01 and 0.05, this implies that there is moderate evidence that the diet has an effect. Whereas if the p-value is less than 0.01, that implies that there is a strong evidence that the diet has an effect. In statistics, we like to be 95% sure about things. We would therefore say that the diet has a significant effect 
only if the p-value is less than 0 0.05. Since our previous p-value was 0 0.54, which is greater than 0 0.05, we draw the conclusion that the diet has no significant effect on the weight. In addition to compute the p-value, we can also compare the t-statistic to the critical values of the t-distribution. The critical values that define 95% of the area of the t-distribution with 5 degrees of freedom are approximately negative 2.57 and positive 2.57. When the t-statistic is located between these critical values, then we know that the corresponding p-value is bigger than 0 0.05, which means that we can draw the conclusion that the diet has no significant effect. Suppose that the t-statistic was instead computed to negative 3. When the t-statistic is located outside one of these bounds, then we know that the p-value will be less than 0 0.05. In this example, we see that the t-statistic of negative 3 is located to the left-hand side of the lower critical value. We would then draw the conclusion that the diet has a significant effect on the weight. By using a software, we can also calculate the area to the left hand side of negative 3 and to the right hand side of positive 3. We see that the area in each tail covers about 1.5% of the distribution. The corresponding p value is then the sum of these areas, which is 3% or 0 0.03. Since the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we draw the conclusion that the diet has a significant effect. We'll now have a look at another example where one would like to know if people with a certain disease have a higher or lower systolic blood pressure compared to the general population, which has a mean systolic blood pressure of 120. The value mu0 is therefore the value that we want to compare with, which can be seen as our reference value. We recruit 8 random individuals with a specific disease and measure their upper blood pressure. The mean systolic blood pressure of these 8 individuals is 123.5. Note that this value is a bit higher than the reference value 120, which indicates that people with the disease have, on average, a higher systolic blood pressure than the general population. However, is this difference due to chance, or do people with the disease actually have higher systolic blood pressure? To answer this question, we can use a one-sample t-test. Based on the systolic blood pressure of the eight individuals, we can calculate the sample standard deviation to about 3.96. Next, we calculate the standard error of the mean by dividing the sample standard deviation by the square root of n. We see that the standard error is equal to 1.4. We are now ready to calculate the t-statistic. We plug in the values for the sample mean, the reference value and the standard error. If we do the math, we see that the t-statistic is equal to 2.5. Since we have blood pressure values from 8 individuals, the degrees of freedom is equal to 8 minus 1. We therefore use a t distribution with 7 degrees of freedom. The critical values that cover 95% of the t distribution with 7 degrees of freedom are about negative 2.36 and positive 2.36. We see that 2.5 is outside this interval, which indicates that the p value is less than 0 0.05. Based on the t-statistic, we can use the software to calculate the area to the left-hand side of negative 2.5 and to the right-hand side of positive 2.5. The total area of these two tails covers approximately 4%, which represents our p-value. Since the p-value is equal to 0 0.04, which is less than 0 0.05, we can therefore draw the conclusion that the mean systolic blood pressure for people with the disease is significantly greater than 120. In other words, we can be quite confident that the difference we observe between our sample mean and reference value is not simply just due to chance.
which means that the people with the disease actually do have a higher mean systolic blood pressure than the general population. This was the end of this lecture about the one sample t-test. In the next lecture, we'll discuss the difference and similarity between the one sample t-test and the confidence interval. Thanks for watching.